You're listening to RevOps FM with Justin Norris. Welcome to RevOps FM, everyone. Today we are joined by the amazing Sydney Waterfall, SVP of Marketing at Refine Labs, where she leads GTM and revenue for the vault. And now, if you're not familiar with Refine Labs, well, you really should be. They're a demand generation agency that, from my point of view, have really been leading the discussion when it comes to go to market strategy over the past four years or so. And their thought leadership has had a big impact on me. It's changed a lot of the ways that I look at marketing. And I think Sydney has been one of the most prominent voices from Refine Labs out on LinkedIn, evangelizing a different and better way to do marketing. So Sydney, I am super excited to have you here today. Wow. Thank you for that intro. That's great. I'm <laughs> super excited to chat with you. Let's have a just a little bit of background. I know you've been at Refine Labs about three years or so. What led you to there? Yeah, I was always in B2B SaaS and kind of on the demand and operation side is my background. Been a longtime listener of season one of Demand Gen Live with Chris Walker and Gatana Denardi. And I was listening to all of that, trying to transition my org that I was at off the MQL hamster wheel, do a more modern approach, and was pretty successful in some of the initial pilot and the proof of concepts that I was able to run, especially with our paid media spend, but ultimately couldn't really get the full alignment of the company on board. And so I thought, well, what if I could work for Refined Labs? Uh, (laughs) And it kind of a serendipitous. I was closely connected with Judy Sheriff, who had been working at Refined Labs. So it kind of just, it was a, it's, big world, but a small world in tech at the same time. And so it kind of just worked out. And I started at Refine Labs, I think as employee number 15 back in, was interviewing in 2020. And I started in 2021, right at the beginning of the year. So I'm coming up on my anniversary in January, actually. Which is like being a dinosaur in tech, you know, to stay at a place more than two years. Yeah. It's like, okay, you're a legacy now. Or like we say, you're like a five-year, tenured employee if you're there for two years. <laughs> you get the Rolex watch and everything like that. I want to give a shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, Knack. You know, I love marketing automation software, but let's be honest, the email and landing page builders are usually terrible. You can't make it nice without a developer and marketers are going to find a way to break things or go off brand. You do not have time for that. So Knack is totally different. You set the guidelines and then give your users a build experience that's slick, modern, and beautiful. When they're done, everything goes to your map at the push of a button. And don't worry, it supports global teams, approval workflows, it's got your integrations. So head on over to revops.fm forward slash NAC, that's K-N-A-K, and get a special offer just for my listeners. So, I mean, you alluded to the MQL hamster wheel, which is, I know, something that Chris often talks about on his podcast. And Refine Labs has clear opinion and perspective on a lot of the things that are not working well in B2B. It's probably a, a sizable a list. And I'm curious for you, you know, we're a few years into this message being out there. What are some of the things that you're still seeing in the market that are just not working? People doing things that are broken, that are not effective. What does it look like from your perspective? So surprisingly, you know, we've been talking about an not just us, but other people, other marketers, other people in the market have been talking about, you know, the transition from lead gen to demand gen and, you know, kind of beating that drum for the past two to three years. And a lot of people are kind of like, oh, like we get it. You know, it's an old message, right? Surprisingly, though, a lot of people are still running a like a predominantly lead gen driven approach, especially in larger organizations. And I think that's just due to the fact that larger organizations are slower to change and take a lot more convincing to change. So the more agile or slightly smaller orgs are kind of shifting faster. So even though it's maybe to some people a message that they've heard a lot, it's still very much being executed in a predominantly lead gen approach and overall go to market. Like, how are we going to get these marketing qualified leads? How are we going to qualify them? People are still forecasting that way. So that's still very much a thing. I would say that there's a good chunk of companies, especially in tech, that are adopting a more blended approach or they're trying to do a hybrid and then transition into a full demand gen approach. A couple of other things that I've seen that have stayed the same are the lack of importance on data structure and operations just in general as a function which I'm sure you're very 
aware of and probably people that listen to this podcast are probably nodding their heads. I do think that is slightly changing, though, given the macroeconomic conditions. It's forcing companies to be more strict or more like, quote unquote, data driven. And it's like no longer an excuse not to have data to report on certain things anymore. Like that's not acceptable. It's not an excuse. Your CFO is not going to care. Your CMO is more motivated to fix these things. Same with all of your leadership. So I think that's turning, but it's still very much something I say that has stayed the same in organizations. And then outside of I would say like media and demand. I just think something that has stayed the same is lack of focus on messaging and positioning, which leads to like clearer differentiation in the market and the messages that you're putting out. That one is huge. It never ceases to amaze me. Like we'll spend so much money distributing a message that might not be resonating or that is just full of buzzwords that doesn't make sense. That's undifferentiated. You alluded to the difference between lead gen and demand gen, and maybe just for the benefit of people that don't have have that distinction firmly in their minds. How would you summarize that in a nutshell? Yeah. So lead gen is really the act of marketing to acquire an email address or a singular lead. It's very conversion based at a very high level. And the goal is volume, not necessarily quality. It's kind of an assembly line. You know, this goes back to gated content, webinars, just to get people to consume them, register and get the email addresses to pass to sales. I think it's also a little bit of a mindset too. It's not just necessarily the tactics. It's like ingrained in mindset in the organization. It's kind of built into an operating model. The demand gen approach, which there's so many different definitions of demand gen, but from what we think is really this concept of creating demand, capturing demand, and converting demand. And that's doing that in a buyer-centric way. So I can break down the definitions of those terms as well. Demand creation is proactively educating your target market who may not be aware of the problems or challenges that your product solves. They might not even be aware of your overall category or your overall brand reference. That's essentially the 95 to 99% of people. So creating demand in a demand gen approach is going to be much more focused on educating people without having to gate that content or acquire information from them like a lead gen approach would be, right? So instead of taking any asset or content and asking something, asking for an email address or something in return and then giving it, you're giving it up front and educating them without a known lead. So think about it from like a known lead conversion to kind of anonymous education there. And then Then demand capture is really acquiring solution-aware prospects that are actively searching for your solution. So this is, you know that they're actively searching. You can tell by the intent based on the channel or based on first-party intent as well. So think about like review sites, Google search, high intent keywords, like you know that they're actually in buying mode. So that's demand capture. And then converting demand is really once you have that demand captured, how are you going to guide them down a process, usually a sales process, but guide them down an experience to purchase a product? I have seen over the past one to two years, this approach take shape in the marketplace in the sense that I can identify companies predominantly on LinkedIn, maybe on other channels where I can see they are creating demand. They're self-consciously going out trying to create demand. I would say Hockey Stack is a company that stands out for me. I don't know if they're a client of yours or not, but they seem to be doing a really good job of that from my point of view. At the same time, I've also spoken to people where they kind of conceptually understand the importance of doing this. They can see it. That's not the gap. The gap is more, okay, but then wait a second, how do we measure it? So it's kind of like, let's create demand, but oh, wait a second. I don't know what the world looks like when I go out on that limb and everything that's familiar kind of becomes stripped away. And so there's a huge inertia has been my observation, keeping companies in the existing ways of doing things. I don't know if you've seen that too. Yeah, I would very much agree. That's one of the things that we help with the most is kind of, okay, come in. I'm bought in on the methodology. I like this way of marketing, but like, I'm not really sure how to make this strategic shift in my organization. And I say that because it is a strategic shift in your organization. It's not at the marketing level. It's not just like, oh, the marketing team's going to be doing some new things here. <laughs> You're going to be seeing some new stuff. It's, it's really a strategic shift. And I think measurement and then the actual execution of the strategy are the two things that companies struggle with the most in order to actually get this off the 
ground. So how do you implement something like this? Well, the first step is acknowledge and accept that the buyer behavior has changed and your current approach, maybe it's lead gen, maybe it's something else, who knows, is maybe not as effective and you want to change your mindset and you want to adopt this new strategic approach, right? You kind of have to have that strategic mindset saying, yes, I want to go down this path. It's really hard to change someone's mind. Just ask, is is that all the way up to like the CEO level, like full board level alignment? How deep does that alignment need to go? I think it depends on the size of the organization, not necessarily board level, but when we get into measurement, we'll hit on probably board level (laughs) metrics. I definitely see the marketing leader and the sales leader and the operations leader. So any go-to-market leadership kind of needs to be bought in. Normally, what we've seen is like marketing's really driving the strategic change. However, sometimes sales will come to us and say, hey, like we want you to help us and our marketing team. So it's interesting when sales comes in as the driver, right? That's like, okay, what's happening here? But at the leadership level, not necessarily has to be at the CEO or board level, but definitely at the leadership level, that level might look a little bit different if you're talking in a big org. Maybe you have global teams, regional teams, you know, the, you're going to have more levels. So maybe it's at like the SVP level and not the C level, depending on structure and your internal politics and things like that are. And also like your internal trust too. It's a transition. It's not just like, hey, switch this off, turn this on and we'll see how it goes. So you can kind of phase into it as well. That is step one is really kind of acknowledging that, trying to change the mindset. And I think you just need like two or three champions at that leadership level to kind of really take it. The next step is after you change your mindset, it's measurement. Everything always comes back to the KPIs the goals and how we're being measured and how is the business looking at this from a performance standpoint. So, you know, instead of focusing on a conversion-based lead approach, we really have to take a step back and say, okay, you're used to net new contact, inquiry, lead, MQL, and everything super trackable at each of those funnel stages. When we make this transition, basically what we are doing is we're saying, we're not going to force the buyer to become known to us. We are going to let that buyer be anonymous until they are ready to convert on their time, which means we're going to lengthen the window where we don't have all this great trackable data around that person. But by doing that, we're going to have a much better experience and we're going to drive better quality conversions on higher quality offers than what we're doing right now that maybe is less effective. And that idea, I think, provokes existential terror in some people who are so you, but no, but my waterfall, my, my metrics, my funnel, how do you overcome those objections when they come up? So the first thing is say, we take a step back and say, we are still going to look at MQLs, but we're going to probably have a different definition of what an MQL is than what you're used to. And we can still look at people engaging with content and net new subscribers or net new leads, but the volume is going to go down. So yes, people do kind of panic and say, oh gosh, well, how do I forecast? And like, how do I know? What are my leading indicators? So we kind of go through that process with them. Like we're still going to track, you know, cost per MQL and go all the way down your funnel, but what the MQL means is going to be different. We very much lean into instead of blending all MQLs together, we're going to look at cost per declared intent, hand raisers versus non-hand raisers. So we're kind of splitting the funnel there and saying, okay, and that's what we really like to focus on is when you make this change, you're going to see overall MQLs go down. But in, depending on your sales cycle, but in about a quarter to two quarters, you should see your hand raisers or what we call declared intent MQLs increase. And the quality of those and the conversion of those are going to result in more qualified opportunities, pipeline, and revenue. And so we have to really honestly like model that out for people to see. So then they say, okay, well, my Top of funnel volume is going to go down. I'm not going to have as much success at like forecasting how many meetings marketing is going to source or that top of funnel. But when we model that out for them, I think it helps kind of show them, okay, well, now we're going to look at this. It's going to be lower volume. What else should we look at? So we call them kind of leading indicators. So we want to look at, you know, 
traffic to, but from all sources, not just paid sources, right? But like traffic to your high intent pages, engagement with the campaigns that we're running, not necessarily click through rate, but actual engagement with the messages and things like that. And you also have some in platform conversions that you can set up that are limited, but they can give you some data on view through conversion or direct conversion not as good as it used to be. So there's some leading indicators that you can look at, but it's very much a, I have to trust this. You kind of feel like you're putting all your eggs in in one basket for like a little while until you start seeing those leading indicators come through. And really when the aha moment comes is when the pipeline, we can show you quarter over quarter and we focus on qualified pipeline or what we call hero pipeline, which is standardized. When we can show you your hero pipeline increased 50 to 100 percent and you had the same budget and we just deployed a different strategy, that's when you're like, okay, I trust it. I'm ready. Like now let's go like all in on this. Mm -hmm. But it ta- it's a, it's baby steps. Any transformation is, is going to take a little while. And when you talk about running a campaign, like it's totally clear to me the way that you and Chris and Refine Labs create demand. Like you have smart people, you go out on LinkedIn, you post interesting and provocative things, people engage with it, and it drives the conversation in a lot of ways. And for a company that doesn't necessarily have that already set up, does everybody need to find like a Chris Walker within their own company? Or is it just about, you know, paid LinkedIn ads that aren't gated, that are just more about exposure? Like there's a a reductive way of looking at it, but obviously there's a more sophisticated thought process that goes into planning these strategies. How do you think through that? Yeah, most of our clients don't have a huge evangelist that is out there evangelizing or a subject matter expert that is comfortable like going very public on social and like leaning into their personal brand. I would say only probably 20 to 25% of our clients have that or have someone that's like willing to kind of dabble in that. I mean, half of our clients don't even have a podcast, but we're still able to execute a strategy with them that is different and kind of gets them there. It's funny, more, more of our mature customers that have been with us a while Once they start seeing results, when they start going, then they'll say, okay, now we feel good about like we have this engine going. Let's, what about a podcast? And we're like, okay, great. You know, (laughs) like we'll layer that on as the next growth lever for you. So it really comes down to, you can take your existing assets and your existing content and repackage them in a different way. So that's like step one, easy win. Take your customer reviews, take your product and solutions pages and kind of those types of content on your website. And you can package them up and not just say, you know, hey, check out this solution, click here, but actually take some of the content that's on those pages. That's the value that you actually want people to read and repurpose that into a campaign or into a campaign angle is kind of what we call campaign strategy. Don't just literally copy and paste it and put it in an ad and expect it to work. But take that value or whatever on your solutions page that you really want to get across. And we can communicate that in organic or in paid and or both in a different way. So I'll kind of give you an example. Most of our, we call them product value ads and product awareness ads. And these are just light ways of talking about, here's the problem that you might be experiencing. Here's a way to solve it. This is probably content that's already on your website somewhere, hopefully. (laughs) Hopefully it's on your website. And you're communicating what we call problem awareness. Like, hey, you might have this problem. Hmm, I didn't ever think about it that way. But yeah, sometimes I do have that problem, right? And then the product value add is like, hey, here's an interesting way to solve that. And you could solve that in like, you know, X, Y, Z using this product. So that's an example where you kind of take some content you already have. You're going to repackage that content into like an educational and value driven way that's slightly different than the copy on like your website and things like a unique take on it or have a kind of a theme around it. And then you could distribute that on social. That's a very like tactical, like I don't have any additional content resources to create net new content for me. So like, what can we do in the meantime? That's typically where we start. And then from there, we also work with content teams. A lot of times you might have a defined point of view or content strategy that is communicated not on social or not on certain 
avenues. So maybe you have some really great blog posts that point out great problems, great solutions, just great thought leadership, but it's not articulated in a great way to repackage on social or repackage in video. So you can do that. At a high level, like if we were starting from scratch with someone in a content team, we would say, great, let's document. Hopefully you have a defined point of view. Let's look at your content strategy. Then we're going to create content that is educational, differentiated, and valuable to your market. Not necessarily to your core buyer, but to your market. Then we're going to distribute that content in a buyer-centric approach, which means ungated, designed for the platform that we're going after. And then you're going to package that content in a way that's unique, which is where creative comes in. The key here is then having something to anchor that content to. So if you do have a live event series or you do have a podcast or you do have something that people can engage with that isn't, you know, request a demo or isn't, you know, sign up for my product tour, you need to kind of have some type of thing in the middle that people can still learn from you and engage from in a, in a nice way. Like for us, it's our podcast. That's what we route everybody to is our podcast. And then from there, it's to our live events. Not to say everybody needs that, but that's kind of an example. Have you ever seen this approach not work? You know, that's a, a strange question, but in a sense, can it work for everyone? Or are in some cases, do you hit roadblocks of certain things that need to be resolved? Like actually, you, you don't have your message worked out, kind of like what we were talking about. You're not speaking the right language. Or are there other factors that might affect whether this can be effective for a company? If you do not have a basic, decent, repeatable, somewhat repeatable sales process, I wouldn't, I wouldn't start, I wouldn't start trying to create demand because then it's just going to be a little bit of a nightmare. So you need to kind of have some sales basics. You don't need to have a huge sales, robust engine, huge flywheel with, you know, you got everything figured out, but you need to have, okay, we know how to talk to prospects. We know what they care about. We can, we can consistently like convert prospects from meetings into pipeline into closed one. And the reason I say that is because you need to know what it is actually resonating with a buyer when they are ready to convert and when they are ready to buy. If you don't know how to convert a buyer when they're ready to buy, you're not going to know and figure out and be effective of creating demand. I've never seen that done. I'm sure someone will, you know, say something or prove me wrong, I'm sure. But no, like sense. I've never seen that. I really appreciate you explaining it. That, like the demand creation process broken down that way, I've probably listened to, I don't know, a hundred demand gen live or revenue vital podcasts, but sometimes like the, just the specifics of like, how does it act, you know, I'm the type of person I want to know, like, how does it actually work? And that really explains a lot. I want to just shine a spotlight for a second on the role of ops. We're speaking about go to market more broadly, but I have kind of an ops centric audience here. What should that role be? within go-to-market? Because it varies a bit, I think, between marketing and sales ops, but we often tend to be very tech-focused or focused on territory, compensation, planning, stuff like that. What's the evolution, if any, from your point of view that ops teams need to make to perform at their highest level within this type of motion? For the record, I just also consider myself kind of an ops nerd. So I love talking anything Salesforce, marketing automation all the time. So I think that's honestly why you and I just get along so well in our previous chats. So that's just for the record. But I think ops is a very crucial and like pivotal part of a successful go-to-market team. I think without it, you're like, I don't even know what you're doing. However, what I see with ops happen, I mean, it's very similar to every any function in your go-to-market team. You're going to want a strategic side and you're going to want a creative kind of side and you're going to want a tactical execution side. I look at that the same way I would look at any org. You want that in marketing. You want that in sales. You want that in customer success. And so I think that is how I would say like the best revenue operations or whatever you want to call operations teams these days. I, I think that's how they operate. So strategic to kind of execution. What I have seen and I think it's no fault of operations. I just think it's the mindset of, oh, well, that is a very tactical analytical function. Like maybe it's a less strategic function. I'm like, absolutely not. I'm like, if ops is a strategic function in your org, you are going to like be a powerhouse org, in my opinion. 
And I, I see that from like orgs that operate at a very high level. So I think they sometimes fall down and there's a lack of understanding from operations team of just like the overall customer journey and how like sales and marketing and success really fit together as a function. And this is something I've learned as a marketer in my department is in order for me to be successful at a strategic level, I need to understand how sales works. I don't need to execute sales, but I like really need to understand how sales works. I need to be involved and understand that function and understand their pains and their needs. And the same thing with ops. I think that's why I love ops is I sometimes will do ops. Like I run our whole HubSpot and Salesforce and things like that. I love jumping in and helping clients with like ops specific things. So I have some execution in ops, but that doesn't mean you need it. But you really need to understand their role, their value what their day-to-day is, and like the overall function and how it fits into the rest of the business. And I think that's honestly the same if you want to be a leader in any org that you're in. And so that's kind of where I see ops not like pushing the boundaries. I'll just give you a quick example. Understand marketing tech, understand how it all works, can do anything in analytics, pull any report for you, but they're not actually giving you insights about the report or what the data means or what you should do with the data, right? Like that's like the step up. And this is not a generalization. I'm not like trying to like (laughs) make anybody bad here. This is just what I've seen. But the people that understand, oh, that's how a marketing campaign works. And I understand how those channels work. And I understand how customers would interact with those channels. Then they also understand the data and they're proactively giving insights to the CMO or to whoever. I'm like, that is the value of the strategic ops person. Totally agree. The light bulb moment for me is, yes, my team is here. We are in service of the revenue teams. We're helping them. We're enabling them. But you can't perceive yourself as separate from that and not having accountability for that. You really do need to perceive yourself as a revenue leader in your own right. How you affect and help that revenue you know, come into being is a little bit different. You're not selling directly or, or marketing directly per se, but you're still there helping drive strategy, helping challenge what's happening. And I think that mindset shift is really elevating for operations teams. Yeah, I would agree. I think the best dynamic duos that I've worked with or seen is the marketing leader and like the head of RevOps who is very strategic or whoever it does, titles, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's interesting because I'm seeing a lot more titles and job descriptions around that, like go-to-market strategist or go-to-market strategy and analyst and you know, or RevOps like strategists and analysts. And I'm like, oh, like I think it's going in the right direction. But I think that would be my advice to anyone, not just operations people. This is not like picking on ops at all. I think anyone that's trying to get to a strategic level in any org, you need to understand how the other orgs fit in and you need to elevate like all of them together. Like, when I look back at my career, people ask you, how'd you get from A to B? And I was like, I just started going outside of my lane and trying to figure out like, hey, this SDR conversion was awful. Why? How can I fix that? Like, what was it an issue in their system? Like, or is it something marketing is doing? Is it something I could improve? Is it something like I could work with our Salesforce admin to improve? So I would, you know, just kind of take that mindset of like, hmm, let me go talk to the marketer who's like responsible for these campaigns that I don't think are doing very well. Or maybe they're doing great, or maybe you don't know if they're doing great or not, but you should have that conversation. Like, well, what do you think about these results? Are these good results to you or why or why not? Kind of educate each other on that. I think is a good like tactical tip that anyone can take. So you gave me a good pivot point there to talk about measurement and attribution, which is a huge topic. I know that Refine Labs is a particular point of view on this that I want to talk through. And then I also want to even just talk that, you know, everyone has their own taxonomy and, and terminology around channel and source and things like that. So just curious, if you were to come in, you know, set up a, a Salesforce or a HubSpot or whatever from scratch, how would you instrument it to track the things that you think are important to measure this type of go-to-market motion? Yeah, this is a great question. I feel like we could do a whole podcast <laughs> just this, to be yeah. honest with you. But yeah, if I were to come in and set something up from scratch, I will kind of give you an overview of how I might look at that and how I might do that. So your marketing automation system is, depending on what you use, is going to track something. But you need to understand what that is. HubSpot, the way that they track 
original source is very different than like Marketo. The first thing that I would make sure, I'm just going to go from the top of the funnel down and not necessarily I would do it in this order. The first things first is I always would actually probably fix current sales things that are happening in Salesforce first. But I would make sure that we have standardized UTMs and we're actually talking about UTMs in the same way as an organization. So source, medium, campaign, term, and defining and having those values set as like, these are the values we use for source. These are the values we use for medium. I'm a big proponent of session-based UTMs specifically. So being able to not only track the UTM that got you to the site, making sure that we have cookie tracking set up to track, you know, first touch and also session-based UTMs so that When someone does convert on a form or when they do become known, I can know what UTMs drove the session that resulted in that known conversion. A lot of times that's a huge thing that I see is they're tracking UTMs, but it's not associated with the actual session that they became known. It's like the very first touch that they ever came to the site. Both are so you, are you maintaining, sorry to jump in, but are you maintaining yep. a parallel set of fields like first touch and most recent or first touch and, and yeah, you know, first conversion touch, and touch or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you'll notice that first, last, and conversion are going to be common themes through all these different data points. And this is not like you could do multi-touch. This is like outside of any attribution opinions you may have. This is just like straight funnel tracking, I think, that you should have. So same thing, UTMs, you got first touch, we say conversion touch, which is like the session that actually drove the conversion, if you have it, or if, you know, where was the refer, was it organic direct referral or UTM based, right? And so that's going to tell you a lot of information. And then we go to the next phase, which we refer to as a conversion. A conversion is anytime your sales team is working something. So the reason we say that is MQL is really thinks about as Well, it's only when marketing sends leads to sales, but I actually want to track a conversion anytime sales is working on something, whether they're going outbound, whether they're getting a referral from a partner, whether they, you know, got a sales sourced DM. Like, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's marketing, if it's not marketing, if I don't care where it came from. I want to know, like, how many conversions is the sales team working and what is the outcome of those conversions? So that's why we kind of go a little bit past MQL, but MQL is the thing that's known most to people of like, okay, that's what I need to track this stage. From there, so that's what we call like conversion. You can have multiple conversions per, just like you have multiple MQLs per person or per account. They're kind of, you know, they can come back in the cycle, they can go out of the buying cycle, come back in. And then from there, I want to track meeting booked, meeting sat, meeting, you know, deferred or something like that, no show, all those things. I want to track that funnel stage and the sub stages of that. And then I'm going to probably track like what, depending on your sales cycle, but what happens next normally is opportunity create. Sometimes the opportunity after the meeting, after sales accepts it, whatever that is in your sales process, whatever occurs, I would say at least generate an opportunity at that point, if not before. And then the sub stages of those within the opportunity, I'm also going to stand up what uh, we call as a high intent revenue opportunity, which is kind of one of our branded terms, hero for short. And basically what that does is it looks at all of your opportunities from all sources and it's going to look by source. What is my opportunity stage that converts at 25% higher win rate? The reason we do that is just because not all leads are created equal. Not all pipeline is created equal. So an outbound sourced opportunity might convert different than a product-based opportunity or a website declared intent. And it's not surprising that they convert differently in the funnel. And then I'm going to track closed one. The layer on top of that, those that's kind of the core funnel stages. The layer on top of that is I want to know the source. So like, where did the buyer, when I say source, I'm talking about where did the buyer come from? A lot of people will initially think campaign. Oh, you want to think campaign. Campaign is detailed of that. But I want to think how I explain it to some people is like the offer. What did the buyer do? Not what we did, but what did the buyer interact with? 
Did they interact with a webinar? Did they interact with sales? Did they interact with an event? Did they interact on our website at a chat bot or a demo or a contact us? Or did they interact with just signing up for our newsletter? So it's more of like what the buyer engaged with. That's what I want to know. When you're you're talking source, you're thinking about the term that I would usually use for this is offer, but the thing that they engaged with, the, the the destination. Okay. Yeah. The destination that they engaged with. And I look at that actually first before channel. I want to know what they did first. And then the second question is, I want to know where did that come from? I don't want to know where did they come from and then what they did, typically, depending on the question I'm trying to answer. But generally, that's how I'm going to look at a funnel. What did they do? And then you'll dig into where did they come from and, you know, what UTMs were associated to it and what self-reported attribution was associated to it, if applicable, and then kind of drill into those different campaign layers, UTM layers, data layers underneath that. Because what they did is typically more predictive of outcomes yes. than where they came from. That, and I've, yes, I've seen that's that what we've well. seen yeah. consistently across multiple data sets. It's a more consistent predictor of what their conversion is going to be in the funnel. And then where that they came from can also give you a little, oh, I think that contact us from organic or direct is probably going to have a higher conversion rate than that contact us from, I don't know, this review site. Why? Well, you know, we've got historical data to show that. But also, if you think about it logically, someone's coming directly to you to convert versus they're on a review site, they probably converted on CTAs for four different companies. And for campaign, that's still at the offer level, like the the source or offer and the campaign exist in a sort of parent-child relationship. Yeah. Is there a similar similar thing on the channel side or do you just call it sub-channel? How do you define? Yeah. Like you uh, have a paid, paid search and then AdWords and Bing and whatever else underneath that category. Yeah. Category. And then we use category group, but it's like channel, sub-channel, category, sub-category. So the roll-up fields are just easier for reporting. And I would say board or executive or QBR type data versus, so you'll say, you know, paid social, and then you have all your paid social, Facebook, Instagram, Meta, you know, LinkedIn, TikTok, I don't know, Reddit, whatever you're doing on paid social, then you're going to have, you could have organic social, and then you have your channels, and you can break into that way as well. Now, implicit in what you just described is kind of a different funnel structure than what I think many of us are used to. I think in, in B2B for a long time, we have you know, lead, MQL, SQL, you know, that waterfall, that serious decisions waterfall in various stages of complexity, just drilled into our brain. Our view of reality is wired that way. And this is one of the things we were chatting about a bit by email prior to this recording. But, you know, Chris has talked about in one of his podcasts, how this kind of creates an operating system for a company, like almost without you realizing it, it just becomes an implicit way of structuring budget and KPIs and how you report your board. So everything's wired that way. And you are working on a different sort of model. Just to expand on that a little bit, how is it different? Why? Because you could kind of say, say, well, we have conversions and we have, it's maybe just a different word for MQLs, but I think you mean something deeper than that. So I just want to understand it a bit better. Yeah, definitely. So I would just want to double tap on that point of the demand waterfall is very much in green. I think about how I set up everything, how you report on everything, what actions you do, whether, you know, you kind of realize it or not, like if you take a step back and you're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> if you actually think about it and why we're seeing this funnel being questioned in the marketplace and being pressure tested is because it's a scalability game with that funnel. And it's a very assembly line approach. And as we're seeing in the market, teams are kind of breaking down silos. They're going into more of a revenue-based team where maybe they're not comped on individual department things, but they're, hey, we want to have marketing and all these people comped on this one main metric. And then maybe you have sub metrics based on your role or things like that. But especially if you see at the executive level or leadership level, you also have this concept of, you know, ABM and kind of moving to an all bound approach where, you know, the buyer journey is not linear. They're going to come and interact with multiple things and they're going to come in market and out of market at different times. So like, how do you track that? And that model kind of forces you to track it in a certain way. So I'll give you some examples. I would say one, it's a singular and blended funnel. And I think that's the biggest thing that we're seeing. 
and companies are kind of themselves trying to like break it apart and break it into sub funnels or sub stages or sub things in between to track different outcomes. And when you blend everything together, you don't forecast as accurately as you probably could. You don't spot insights and things that are going well and or not going well fast. And so those are two big things. And I would say the last, I mean, I could go on and on, but the three biggest things is those two that I just mentioned. And I think the it's built around internal departments versus what the customer is doing and how the customer is engaging with you. I think that's the core, I think, philosophical and mindset differences of the model that we're kind of working on. And sure, on paper, every funnel is going to like look like a funnel. Step one, step two, step three, step four, right? Sure. But when we actually break down the model, there's a couple of things that we are doing. We're expanding it to look at the entire go-to-market funnel, not just marketing and sales, but really what the buyer is doing. So there's a couple key innovations I'm going to start at the bottom of the funnel. The concept of pipeline sources. Again, this is what is the buyer interact with at the time when they are ready to convert and talk to sales, not what department did what. Because sales can drive a website conversion just as much as marketing can. Actually, some of the top reps are probably really great at that. (laughs) Or sales can get a declared intent conversion in their LinkedIn DMs or through a referral through their network. They're still getting hand raisers. They're just getting it in a different way and the buyer is converting in a different way. Same thing with events. So it's really kind of like all of these things are working together. So let's remove the internal politics out of it and just focus on what the buyer did. What did the buyer do at the time of opportunity or conversion? And so pipeline sources and splitting that out is a key differentiator and you kind of have funnels underneath that. Then you have your normal opportunity stages and you're going to go through your sales process that's particular to the sales org underneath those. Within that, when we say pipeline, we're going to talk about hero pipeline. So we're standardizing pipeline, just like I mentioned, based on your own historical data. Factual, not subjective definition. So that is going to be standardized based on the win rates. What stage do you reach 25% win rate, maybe that's stage three, just making this up. And then events, maybe it's stage four, maybe outbound, it's also stage four, maybe partner and your partner affiliates and referrals, maybe it's stage three, two, maybe it's higher in the funnel. But then when you say, here's what pipeline we have, it's standardizing that. So removing subjectivity from some of the definitions as much as possible. So pipeline sources are standardized and so is the definition of pipeline underneath the pipeline sources. The key is you have to separate things out in order to standardize them. Then you kind of go up the funnel, which is the idea of a conversion, not a marketing qualified lead and then a sales accepted lead. It's a revenue conversion. It's not what marketing got someone to do something. It's anytime sales is actively spending effort on something is a revenue conversion. And then of those conversions, how many make it to the next step, right? So we're looking at it like across all go-to markets there versus that traditional assembly line, which is marketing did something, then sales is going to review it, then sales is going to accept it. And so now we have these different funnel stages. It's kind of one revenue focus there. There's a challenge here, which I find is common to all account-based funnels where you have multiple people potentially multiple conversions, and then that goes in, you know, all gets kind of narrowed down into a single opportunity. How do you calculate those metrics in a standardized way that they're meaningful? Yes, that's a great question. So there's two different ways to look at this. So I'll talk about how we look at it in the model and how we like would set it up for someone in a model versus how you might look at, to me, a different question to answer, which is how was our account total buyer journey look like, you know? So you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. That's with anything. You're going to have to do that. So what we look at is the originating contact on the opportunity. And then we kind of look at that and look at that conversion. So, you know, some will say, well, it's not the the originating contact. And then they became, you know, not the primary contact. And then we added four other contacts and they weren't the actual decision maker. And yada, yada, yada. We know that there's 
group buying going on. But really what we're trying to track is what sparked that conversion and resulted in a sales conversation. And then what was the result of that conversation to revenue? That's really as simple as it gets. So we draw a line in the sand and say, originating contact on the opportunity. However, you can look at the opportunity level or even the account level and look back and see, hey, here's like the conversions that occurred and the order that they occurred in. Not exactly how the campaign object works in in Salesforce, but similar, like you'd be able to see that. So when we report on it, you can see unique conversions, unique And then you could also see like total like unique accounts from those conversions would be a way to look at that. So just to take a concrete example, uh, Acme is a target account of my company. And we may have had seven conversions of Acme, of which three of them were inbound leads, two downloaded an ebook, one requested a demo. And then we were also multi-threading and going outbound against four people. And one of the outbound people actually ended up responding and being the one that created the opportunity. So of those seven conversions, they kind of distilled down to this one uh, opportunity that was created and that that person would become the originating contact on the opportunity. Am I thinking about that right? Yes. Yeah. And you can, I mean, I'm getting kind of like technical and in the weeds, but (laughs) I tend to do that sometimes. (laughs) You can, like we have a Salesforce managed package that does this, that we've set up. And so you can actually look at the, depending on your sales cycle, if you want to look at a conversion window, like, all right, we're going to look back at the originating contact and we're going to look back 45 days or 14 days, whatever that may be. And we're going to take the last one, even if they have two, for example. So there is an element of where that is going to be unique to the business depending on your sales cycle length, really. But then the problem that this model is trying to solve is understanding what drove sales conversions and the outcome of those sales conversions. We're still very much also still trying to solve the problem of like, how do you effectively measure create demand, which I'm still, that's a gigantic problem we're still trying to solve. But that's the biggest problem that we're solving with this model, because that's what people cannot answer right now with the models that they're using. And then a secondary problem, which I think a lot of people try to answer with funnel, which I don't think you should be answering with your funnel model, is, well, what's going on with everybody in the buying cycle? And what does the account journey and the account buying cycle journey look like? To me, that's a completely fundamental different question. And I would probably use a fundamentally different data set to answer that question than what you should be using as your operating framework and operating model. I think that's a, at least that's how I try to distinguish it in my mind when people start, because then they build funnels around a buyer journey. Then you're in the influence model and you have no idea what's working and what's not. The touches on the question I was going to ask, because when we, the definition of sales conversion or of conversion really is based on the activity of a sales team which kind of gets a little bit into like lead scoring or MQL threshold or the extent to which what sorts of actions are worthy of a salesperson. And some companies are very permissive and sales, you know, if you download an ebook, sales is going to call you versus others are much more restrictive. And you say, you know, I'm only going to, sales only going to reach out to people that meet a certain threshold. So all the things I could go on an ebook downloading spree, you know, on somebody's website, and maybe I still don't reach a threshold for sales to reach out to me. Those things don't count as conversions within this funnel model. They're still part of the account buying journey. Like you said, that's a different data yeah, set. You can still track them in them. campaigns. You can still track the campaign influence. You could still add them to nurture flows. You could still score them. Like that's totally fine. And every organization is going to approach that differently whenever. And I think it actually, if you take this approach and you actually start tracking, like every time sales starts working something and you look back, and you say, okay, what what drove that? Was it an MQL threshold trigger? Great, we're gonna put that in pipeline source, low intent, and then you can tag that as a program as lead score, for example. And we, we kind of help, or you know, we're gonna say, oh, this was a low intent webinar follow up, whatever the you know thing is, and then you'd be able to see whenever sales does this, is this effective or not? Is it worth our resources or not? compared to sales outbound or sales warm list outbound or sales attending an event and getting contacts and meetings booked from people. So it's not, again, it's not like marketing against sales. It's like 
Let's just look at all of the activities our sales team is doing. Where are they coming from, from a buyer point of view? What did the buyer last do to have sales reached out? Which to your point, you know, organizations are going to have sales reach out at a bunch of different times in that life cycle, depending on their own specific thresholds. But if you track it the same way you track everything else in one kind of standardized funnel, it becomes very clear to see what is working and is what, what isn't. That was a light bulb moment for me, actually, how you just described that, because like you said, you could have 500 conversions and maybe 475 of them are webinar follow-ups. And yep, then there's 25 exactly. that were people did a demo request and you know maybe half the demo requests result in an opportunity and maybe two of the 475 webinars. And so you can say, it doesn't mean that webinars aren't important, but is that a good time? It actually is makes you conversion? question, should you, yeah. should you consider that a conversion? It makes you question yes. the definition. Yes. It makes a ton of sense. And then- you know, maybe we go create demand with that webinar content and get buyers into a different stage instead. And you can still run scoring on all your known leads. This is not saying, you know, don't do lead scoring. You don't get content the rest of your life. Like people are going to do what they want to do when they want to do it in an organization. It, but it's just a mechanism for like hopefully being able to track it a little bit better and like a more standardized way across the revenue system that's more focused on the buyer and not what team sourced it and what team gets credit. It's interesting how much of this discussion gets wired around validation of like credit and what's working and what's not, which I actually think is very difficult to tell because even if you see, hey, we had a hundred webinar touch points and these opportunities doesn't necessarily prove anything kind of scientifically about whether there's any causation there. So when you alluded to how you would look at the account journey, what what seems relevant to you? Because I'm how would you take that kind of massive data of all these things that happen? What would you want to look at to gain actionable insight that would maybe drive different marketing behaviors? When I think about account journey or like, you know, all the different touch points or even campaign, understanding all of the campaign data throughout an account or an, even a, a singular opportunity. To me, I'm un trying to understand and find patterns of what is more common and less common at certain personas, certain levels of the organization, and certain times of the buying cycle. That's what I look at, like account journey mapping, buyer journey mapping for. And then I'm going to use that to go optimize my in-channel strategy and possibly investments. But more on the strategy side, that's really what I use that data set for versus funnel data to me, should be very black and white of like, this is what happened. This is what occurred. This was the outcome of that. And let's learn what we can. And we're going to monitor conversion rates. And we're going to be really strict about conversion rates. And we're going to be really on top of SLAs. And we're going to be, you know, I don't know, more, more strict and like watch that type of data like a hawk. <laughs> That's like what's actually like happening in the funnel driving revenue versus the other data set, which we need to act like at all data points. That's when I think it's about pattern recognition, understanding like, okay, this webinars work really well here, but what topics of these, what topics actually work really well in this stage of the journey? Okay, let's take that topic and like put it on some other medium than a webinar and, and serve it up to those people when we think that they're at that stage of their journey. Also, this is a side tangent, but I think people spend a lot like too much time trying to like, especially when you kind of take a more demand gen approach, you don't know, you, you know, buyers aren't known for a long time. And so you don't know what stage of their, you know, beautiful journey that they're on that you're going to get a journey map for when they're done with it. You have no idea. So really, instead of just trying to like over engineer it and create like funnels, like first they see that, then they see this. I take the approach of you would have fu some funnel structure, sure, but I would also challenge you to say, I'm going to serve up content to these people at a bunch of different times and understand like when they react to it because the buying journey is not linear and they're going to go from like, I care about this problem one week to I could care less about this problem the next week because it's not my priority. And three weeks later, they're going to really care about that priority because they have a pain. So that's just my rant. <laughs> I bumped up against this mindset all the time when I was in consulting. And people seem to have this hunger for 
I want this formula for what a buying journey looks like. like. Somehow there's this archetypal buying journey that I can discover. And if I discover it, I can somehow put people down it, which will then cause them to become buyers. It seemed to fundamentally misunderstand the nature of buying and, and human psychology. But even when I actually tried to deliver projects with data scientists and do these things, it, it never was actually very satisfying. People looked at it like, oh, actually, you know, it, it's kind of this like deflating feeling. And we came to a similar conclusion. It's less about I guess webinars or ebooks or something, but it's actually a lot more about the topics and the messages and the themes yeah. that seems to be the important insight that you can actually use and take back into your marketing to do better things. Yeah, I think the best teams that I see execute really focus on like messaging pillars and content pillars and when to talk about what. And then they go into like, you know, distribution and things like that. They're more looking at patterns for topics and pain points and use cases because it's impossible to predict where someone is. They might really care, a CMO or whoever you're going after might really care about that problem one day, but the next day, something else is on fire and they don't care about that till the next month, right? But you still want to be educating them. <laughs> so it's kind of a toss up. Before we close, I want to give a shout out to two Refine Labs products that I know you're very involved in. You alluded to your managed package, Watchtower. You've demoed that to me, it tracks the funnel as well as the attribution around it. Really cool. I think a really interesting product to look at for people that are interested in implementing this and kind of getting a, a quick leg up to get to a solid state much faster than if they had to build it themselves. There's also the Vault, which I know you're very much involved in, which has all the Refine Labs playbooks, frameworks, experiment reports. I have an account. I think I've had an account since day one, and uh, I've read through a lot of it. Really, really valuable stuff that I think will, again, just accelerate your learning if you're interested in diving deeper into these things. So head on over to uh, the Refine Labs website to take a look at that. Sydney, this was super informative, everything I hoped it would be. I'm really glad that we could sit down and, uh, and go through this, and I yeah. uh, would love to chat again about it at some point. Yes. Thank you for having me on. I love when podcasts, we get a little like in the weeds and we kind of get to talk about like, you know, pull the curtain back a little. It's refreshing. So thank you for having me on and asking me these great questions. Hey everyone. I want to invite you over to the RevOps FM Substack community, where you can sign up to get rough transcripts, show notes, longer form articles, and other bonus content. Just head over to revops.fm slash subscribe to get free access. I'd also love to know what you thought of the episode and to hear suggestions for topics you want to learn about. Feel free to leave a comment on Substack or send me an email at justin at revops.fm. Thanks for listening.